Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Marie Lamanche. I'm the project coordinator at the Montreal Institute for Genocide and Human Rights Studies. Um, welcome to our one hour discussion um, titled Ethiopia on the Brink of Mass Atrocities. Um, <laughs> thank you so much to our four panelists for joining us today. Uh, we have Sir Hunter, who is the Communications and Digital Media Officer at the Global Center for the Responsibility to Protect. We have Samahang Abebe, who is a professor at Endicott College, Susan Stigand at USIP, and William Davison, who is Senior Analyst for Ethiopia at Crisis Group. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today from um, wherever you are, the US and the UK. Um, we're going to start first with some remarks from each panelist and then we'll go on to um, some questions. Uh, we really want our panelists to have a real dialogue today um, and then you'll be able to, uh, the audience watching us on YouTube and Facebook will be able to um, ask us some questions. Uh, so thank you so much for being here and I'm really looking forward to this discussion. Uh, Susan, perhaps we'll start um, with you and then we'll go on to William. Great. Thanks, Marie. Thanks for having me as part of this conversation. Um, maybe three sort of main thoughts to get us started here. Um, I think, you know, we're all following closely the crisis that's developed in Tigray over the last four weeks. Um, and, and indeed, it's incredibly concerning how quickly that escalated. And at this stage, it's quite difficult to know the human, humanitarian, economic, and security consequences um, given some of the communication blackout. Um, but at this stage, the estimates are that 45,000 refugees have crossed into Eastern Sudan, a million people displaced, several million people needing humanitarian assistance. Um, so so it's, it's very good reason to be concerned. Um, my, my, I think it's important to keep in mind that this is not happening in a vacuum. And in some ways, this is um, very concerning, but not entirely unexpected. Um, so not unexpected because transitions, um, it's normal to have resistance um, from elite who used to be in power, um, from those who are seeking power, uh, and they're incredibly difficult to lead and navigate. Um, so the, the question comes down really to what, what are the ways to strategically manage that type of resistance in a manner that is nonviolent? Um, I, I, I said that the, what's happening in Tigray doesn't happen in a vacuum, and I think there's a real risk that it obscures um, some of the broader violence um, and displacement that's happened around the country. Um, and we've seen examples of really horrific um, human rights abuses, um, as well as mass displa displacement um, as of September, over 1.8 million people internally displaced. So this is even before, before the current crisis. Um, right now, there's a lot of conversation about how did we get here and um, what what are the roots and how could we possibly manage imagine that a place where there was so much hope um, has turned around. Um, but I think I think the focus really needs to be on the question of how to silence the guns and keep them silent in this moment. And uh, to do that, uh, one of the key steps will really be to start to get some better and ongoing independent investigation into what's taking place. Um, because what we see right now is just a, a ratcheting of rhetoric um, where each party is justified um, in actions, in violence, because of what they perceive um, and have experienced the other party to have done. And so I think um, we know from past experiences that, that having independent investigation, uh, there's been some, I think, important work done by the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission, by Amnesty International, um, but I think this is a place where the United Nations really needs to be activated, whether it's existing um, mechanisms or some sort of hybrid investigation body that can help to, to put a pause on some of this, this rhetoric and concern that's going forward. And then the final point I'll, I'll just make in terms of this, this context is um, what's happening in Tigray is in the broader transition in Ethiopia and also in a broader geopolitical shift in the Horn of Africa and across the Red Sea. And so any response, um, as we saw in Sudan's transition um, over the last couple of years, really needs to think about the interconnectedness of what happens between the countries in the Horn of Africa and the role and the engagement of some of the countries in the Gulf. Um, these actors can be positive um, to help to push towards and forge solutions that are nonviolent. Um, and in cases they can be disruptive and whether that's done intentionally or just because of the, the broader um, political dynamics that are playing out. 
So I'll, I'll finish there for the moment. Thank you. There is a lot of room for, for questions after. Um, William, would you like to uh, go next? Uh, I know you were on the ground. Um, so what have you seen um, happening there? Thank you. Um, yeah, certainly was in was in Ethiopia um, recently, um, but I, you'll just we'll just talk more generally about my my reflections upon the situation. Um, I think um, you know, as Susan mentioned, there's a lot of debate about um, you know the events leading up to this to this conflict, um, and you know the final justifications or the final sort of trigger um, for the conflict, and you know. The, whether whether the war essentially is justified or not, um, I think what I've been concerned about and what Crisis Group have been concerned about um, from from the outset and indeed from the build up, um, because we were prominent in saying that you know the political dispute um, that evolved or degenerated into a constitutional dispute this year, and um, that it really did have the potential for conflict, and obviously we were trying to prevent that conflict um, and and very worried about it. And, and the point here is that um, you know, we've seen the, we understand, we've heard the justifications, um, you know, allegations against the TPLF stretching back decades, uh, particularly maybe over the past two, three years for behavior during the transition. And then a lot of focus on the final act um, of the attack on the military um, by, the, by the Tigrayan um, government. But, but you know, our focus has been on, well, you know, how realistic um, are the um, objectives or how realistic is it to achieve the desired objectives um, given the sort of political realities we have, particularly those in Tigray um, relating to you know, what is the extent of the TPLF's sort of control across Tigrayan government and, and security? What level of support um, does the TPLF have in Tigrayan society or, or more broadly, you know, what level of support is there for kind of questions of Tigrayan autonomy, um, which have become very prominent, um, you know, this year, particularly with the decision to run the election, the election that was classified as, as illegal. Um, so, the, so the point here is that, um, yes, um, you know, the federal government has, you know, has, has for legal reasons, um, with clear objectives, um, which has plenty of support, it has launched this intervention. We are very, very worried about the human cost that will be entailed um, in trying to achieve those objectives um, and also the political damage um, that, that might be that might be caused. Um, again, as Susan mentioned, you know, we are dealing um, the primary problem for all observers here, and of course for those who are suffering, um, is the lack of um, information, the lack of ability to understand what really is the situation on the ground. Um, but certainly, you know, so we, we are trying to build a picture from from fragments. But certainly, it looks very disturbing. And of course, there will be many sort of consequential. Um, you know, it will it will be very important and consequential um, to see um, how the conflict or the resistance uh, to the intervention develops. That will have a huge impact upon the humanitarian situation and also on the broader political consequences. Thank you, William. Oh, uh, just, just, so just, to, yeah. just, so can I just to say one, one, one quick thing to to, to, to finish. I, I will make it quick. Um, you know, on this issue of mass atrocities, um, of course, there is you know very serious violence occurring in Ethiopia, and, and there has been serious political instability for five years. You know, we have reached a situation where many different Ethiopian political communities, ethnic political communities, um, are, are experiencing mass atrocities. Um, that their narrative is one of, of victimization. Mm. Um, now, of course, you know, really that is most prominent amongst the amongst the Tigrayans. That's not the only claim around, but I think that again, the concern we have is that this very um, very fractious and violent political situation with so much bitter uh, contestation that that is going to be, you know, in one way or the other, that that is going to be exacerbated by the advent of full scale conflict. Uh, we've had all sorts of, of terrible intercommunal violence, but because of this move into full-scale war, there is a danger that the type of atrocities that we've seen, including intercommunal atrocities, are exacerbated by that situation. Sorry, thank you. No problem, thank you. 
Um, Simahang, do you want to go next, please? Yes. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, organizing this uh, timely event. Uh, I just want to give a broader uh, political background uh, about uh, the conflict because uh, many people might have caught by surprise uh, uh, about this conflict, but uh, for most of us who have been following the Ethiopian situation, uh, we know that uh, this, this is coming. Uh, I wrote my book uh, in 2014 about uh, ethnic federalism uh, mm -hmm. and the, the impact of uh, really ethnic division. Since the PLF came to power in 1991, uh, the Ethiopian uh, political discourse has been transformed into uh, ethnic, ethnic lines. So the country is uh, divided according to ethnic lines. The constitution provides us uh, the right to self-determination, including cessation of national groups. Uh, and all this has exacerbated uh, the, really, the relationship between the various ethnic groups uh, in Ethiopia. And uh, unt until 2018, TPLF had uh, dominance in the economic, political, and uh, military aspect of the, uh, the system. Uh, you know, TPLF represent a relatively a minority ethnic group, while the majority ethnic groups such as the Amhara and the Oromo were largely excluded from the uh, political uh, system. So 2018, 2017, there was popular uh, protest against the system. Uh, finally, APRDF, which, is, uh, which was a coalition uh, dominated by TPLF, forced to elect the Prime Minister, uh, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed as the new leader. So uh, I think uh, TPLF was expecting that um, Prime Minister Abi Ahmed would uh, continue to operate with the blessing of uh, TPLF, but uh, he swiftly uh, uh, undertaken many reforms and also he consolidated his power and he forced them to uh, relegate back to uh, Tigray. So I think uh, mainly the, the, the problem is power struggle between uh, TPLF and the prime minister or the federal government because uh, TPLF, uh, you know, they feel that they are uh, really the author of this uh, system and uh, they believe that they have sacrificed over 60,000 people to come to power and they, they feel that they have special entitlement to to rule to really to rule Ethiopia, and they couldn't accept the fact that they are really rejected from power. So they have been taking different actions to sabotage reformers and to undermine his power. Uh, there are many pretexts, like they accuse him of uh, dismantling the ethnic federal system and to bring about a unitary government. But uh, the prime minister didn't make any significant reform with respect to the ethnic uh, federal arrangement. Even uh, many people who support him accuse him of uh, entertaining this, this uh, ethnic federal arrangement. The other is the election, the post, uh, postponing the election. The TPLF didn't accept the fact that this election was postponed and they uh, had their own elections and they consider the federal government are, as illegitimate. Uh, finally, I think uh, the, really probably the, the trigger factor for the current conflict is attacking the Northern Command, which was uh, stationed in Tigray. And I think the federal government has no choice but to act and uh, save uh, the lives of uh, the, the really people who have been uh, targeted in the Tigray region. Finally, uh, this conflict uh, started. So yes, uh, there needs to be a peaceful resolution of the political difference in Ethiopia because uh, I think uh, many people may not realize that the country is now deeply divided according to ethnic lines. These atrocities are not new. These have been happening for the last many years. And these atrocities are uh, based on ethnic identity. Uh, in Oromia region, in in Shangul and uh, in, in many other regions, uh, such uh, atrocities, crimes against humanity, ethnic cleansing have been committed. And the last one, which was committed by the Tigran uh, militia group at uh, Maikadra, which has been 
uh, already uh, confirmed by Amnesty International and Interna uh, the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission. They have already produced evidence to suggest that this has been committed by Tigray uh, uh, TPL affiliated uh, groups. So, uh, unless otherwise, there is a political solution for uh, that's really the differences because. On the one hand, there are political groups who want to maintain this ethnically defined political system. There are others who want reforms because uh, they say it's not legitimate, uh, it was not inclusive, as well as it threatened uh, national uh, uh, security as well as unity of the country. So unless the country finds some kind of solution balancing the interest of these groups, I think, uh, even if um, the conflict in Tigray might be contained, there would be more other uh, conflicts happening in the country. So political dialogue, uh, reconciliation, constitutional reform uh, is a way uh, forward to address uh, the root uh, uh, challenges of the country. Thank you. Okay, I think you're on mute, but um, I'm assuming that I'm up next. <laughs> so it's okay. Yeah, Sarah, do you want to go next? <laughs> sure, Thank sure, you. quickly. So um, I think my um, co-panelists have given a really great overview of um, the situation thus far. So I want to build on a couple of points. Um, so my organization, the Global Center for RTP, you know, focuses primarily on um, research and advocacy within the UN in New York and Geneva on populations that are enduring or at risk of mass atrocity crimes. So specifically genocide, war crimes and, and crimes against humanity. Um, and so we've been continually calling attention to the risks of mass atrocity crimes, specifically in the, in the Tigray conflict. Um, uh, where we did see, you know, concerns and risks that war crimes and crimes against humanity, you know, could be perpetrated against civilians there. Um, and, you know, given the the information blackout, um, it's been very difficult, as, as um, others have said, you know, completely ascertain what's been happening on the ground. Um, but there have been reports that have come out um, via refugees that have fled to Sudan. Um, you know, some reporter access has been granted some you know humanitarian aid um or, or the icrc was able to visit a hospital that kind of thing um and and all of those reports can show the hallmarks that you know atrocity crimes you know or crimes that could amount to atrocity crimes or war crimes or crimes against humanity have been committed during during the conflict there um and these are things you know from just indiscriminately attacking civilian areas to the targeting of civilians based on their ethnicity um use of uh, civilians as human shields uh, on humanitarian workers, on healthcare workers, the deliberate blockage of aid, which has been featured very prominently um, by the UN as, as, as one of their calls for, for access. So these are all abuses that can amount to war crimes and, and crimes against humanity under international law. Um, so in a broader context, I do want to build off on what William and um, Samahan said about, you know, broader risks around the country, um, given that there have been, you know, increasing attacks along other fault lines. Um, and, and ethnic tensions throughout the country since, you know, 2018 um, in, in Beneshango Gamuz and Aromia and Southern Nations, Nationalities and Peoples region, you know, since August alone, there's been at least 10 attacks along ethnic lines um, and disputes along some of the border regions um, for various regions, you know, in Afar and Somali areas, the um, Amhara to Gray border and the Ormo Somali border in a couple of different locations. Um, the, the conflicts along those lines have displaced hundreds of thousands of people. Like Susan said, there's, you know, 1.8 million people displaced currently before the Tigray conflict. Um, um, happened. So, so these attacks along ethnic lines could also, you know, possibly amount to crimes against humanity. Um, and the federal forces have also been accused of um, employing, you know, using extrajudicial killings and um, arbitrary detentions to try to address some of these um, ethnic uh, militias in these areas. Um, so that's also, you know, a cause for concern. Um, those are the risks that we we've seen in in the situation in Tigray um, and in a broader sense in Ethiopia. And I think. You know, the widespread international um, community has has been pretty outspoken um, on calls for peace, you know, um, at, uh, the restoration of humanitarian aid, um, you know, the protection of civilians, especially given um, last week, the buildup before the offensive and McClee. Um, also, you know, to have the Nobel Peace Prize when I return to peaceful means of, of addressing this conflict. Um, so, 
you know, the AU has sent envoys, um, you know, the UN and different agencies have been very outspoken. You've got international governments, the UN Office on Genocide Prevention and R2P released a statement um, highlighting risk factors and stating essentially that, you know, if, if the root causes of the conflict in Tigray and, and elsewhere in the situation in Ethiopia don't, aren't addressed, you know, that the, the risk of atrocities remains high. So, um, but unfortunately, I think the UN Security Council, um, you know, they have not met formally. They haven't had a formal statement on the situation due to some of the politics behind that. But um, um, they have met under any other business in an informal manner um, and have been continuing to tr um, to actively, you know, engage on the situation, um, but are very kind of hung up on what's happening with the AU um, currently. But I think we can talk about that a little bit later on. Um, I want to get time for, you know, some of the questions. So I'll stop there. Well, yeah, you have given us all some a lot to talk about. Um, obviously, our main focus one is on civilians and the risk um, that um, for civilians. What is the humanitarian situation like right now? Burns both in terms of what 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 has happened to civilians. I know a lot of them have fled the region, and then how is what is humanitarian access like? I know there's been. Um, some there were some talks yesterday, I think, at the UN. So I, I would like to know what, what you know what's happening on the ground to us precisely for for civilians. I don't know. I, I know a lot of you can like the four of you can answer these this question. So whatever comments you have, Susan or William or do you, who wants to go first? I mean, um, I mean, I think uh, obviously, like the you know the trouble is at the moment um, is that you know the telecommunications blackout by and large is in place. Um, media access is highly restricted. Um, access to humanitarian agencies, highly restricted um, and, and, and simply not, not, not happening to most of, of Tigray, most of the region. So we really don't know what the situation is. Um, you know, there was a pretty alarming report by UN um, OCHA today about you know, dwindling food supplies um, huge amounts of of displaced people and that type of thing. Um, I think the bigger picture, though, um, is that yes, there was the agreement between the UN um, and the government yesterday. Um, but it seems clear um, that whilst the federal government will be um, trying to uh, restore um, you know, aid um, and other government services to areas that it controls, this will be done in a pretty restrictive manner. Um, so that the government will be very much in charge um, of you know, which, aid, which aid agencies are operating and where they're operating. Um, it will be a very heavily um, and closely managed operation, as it often, often is in Ethiopia. And then also the reality will be that unless the federal government is able to establish um, control across all of, of Tigray, so you know, to, totally get on top of the security situation, then in the areas where there are ongoing security problems, there will be even more restricted humanitarian access and, pro and possibly just the continuation of, of no access at all. And then as time goes on, if there are areas where um, there is thought to be opposition activity or opposition sympathy, um, opposition to the provisional government, that is, um, then also that is likely to be heavily restricted as well. So what we've seen you know, in terms of the refugee flow, um, I think it's a 46,000 now. That's primarily, you know, that's from West Tigray, um, you know, where there was the initial incursion by federal and, and Amhara forces. The rest of the picture involves a lot of internal displacement. Um, and really, you know, at the moment, um, very little um, insight into exactly what conditions look like um, on the ground. Thank you. Uh, let me say a few words. Yeah, I think uh, such conflicts uh, would affect uh, civilians because, uh, as, as, you, uh, as you mentioned, uh, there is a communication blackout and we don't know, we don't know what's happening on the ground and uh, 45,000 uh, refugees already in South Sudan. But I think uh, what's really a positive aspect uh, is that uh, it looks like uh, the major hostilities uh, looks over because the, the, the federal government claimed to have controlled the capital city and it looks that, uh, it looks there is no any major confrontations uh, and uh, there, there, there will not be, I hope, more displacement of, of people. 
And there is already an agreement between the United Nations and the Ethiopian government to provide humanitarian assistance uh, for the people. I think uh, in the next <coughs> weeks, the situation will be uh, improved. Uh, but I think uh, the, the, the government has also restored uh, telephone and internet services to the western part of the region, like where the, uh, the uh, Maikadra and uh, other regions. So I think let's be clear. Yes, we don't have information about many of the things happening in, uh, uh, in Tigray, but there are also uh, cases where we have sufficient information about like Maikadra, where Amnesty International and the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission have confirmed and have evidence and any interested group now could go and access the evidence that uh, Segre affiliated militia and security forces were killing ethnic Amharas, asking identity cards, and uh, they murdered 700 people. I think we have information, we have evidence, and uh, let's be clear about what we don't have information and why uh, uh, about what we don't uh, we don't we don't have information. So uh, let's act on issues where we have evidences. So that's how we can address uh, the problem. Thank you. Uh, maybe I could add something here. I I think um, I mean as you ask about the humanitarian situation. Um, it's all incredibly complex. And um, some of my Ethiopian colleagues and, and um, partners um, underline that if we think that there is a simple narrative, then we're missing um, part of the picture. And so as we think about the populations who are displaced, just, just in the circumstance of, of the violence in Tigray, um, but I would, I would say again, you know, this, is, this is in the context of a much broader humanitarian um, crisis that's taking place across the country. Um, there, there were over a million Eritrean refugees who were living in Tigray prior to, to this violence. Um, that uh, part of the displacement includes people um, who, who come from Tigrayan ethnic group as well as Amhara ethnic groups. Um, in the deployment um, of the federal government, you had the Ethiopian National Defense Forces along with Amhara militia. Um, there are reports um, that I think are fairly well corroborated of some sort of Eritrean involvement across the border. And so the complexity of what, what we see in that circumstance, I think, for me, points towards um, a, a real humility around the lack of information that is there. And, and I, I hope that what we hear um, from, from the government in terms of the end of their military operation um, means that the guns are silenced. Um, but I'm really concerned that the TPLF continues to say that this fight is not over. Um, and while they have retreated from the capital, um, it's not clear where they are and what the next strategy looks like. And so I think as, as people are contemplating what, what a humanitarian response looks like, it's remembering that there, there wasn't sufficient funding to address the humanitarian concerns of the 1.8 million who were displaced prior to this violence. Um, the UN has requested another 147 million to support those who are in Sudan. Um, and, and I think there's, there's a very high risk that we haven't seen the end, end of violence. And so that further complicates. Uh, and then I would just caution that, you know, the, the work of humanitarian organizations in these contexts is incredibly complex, takes great courage, puts, puts individuals, um, both Ethiopian and otherwise, at, at great risk. Um, and uh, advancing the humanitarian principle amidst such a complex set of of conflict dynamics um, means that there has to be constant analysis and understanding of what's taking place so that, mm -hmm. that, that indeed humanitarians can uphold this principle. And, and I've heard so far there's, there's some concern that if, if corridors are opened rather than broad unfettered access, that, that there's a risk that this may um, further entrench mm -hmm. um, some of the divisions that have developed over the course of, of this fighting. So I think that's something to be really careful about from the perspective of, of risks of, of atrocities and mass violence. Thank you. Sarah, would you like to add a, a few uh, comments? Um, sure. So I think um, the overview by um, everyone else was, was pretty sufficient. But um, I do want to just draw attention to, you know, the fact that Prime Minister Abiy said, you know, in Parliament on Monday that, you know, not a single civilian had, you know, been killed by the um, by the federal forces in operations. Um, and, and 
you know, just from the, the you know, the few reports that are coming out um, of some of the more um, eastern areas, like it's, I just don't think that that's, you know, entirely accurate. And I think it's um, definitely um, problematic to kind of say that just because I feel like it lays the groundwork for um, some kind of rejection that, you know, the federal forces or their allies, you know, these Amhara militias as well, um, took any part in um, a targeting of civilians. And, you know, we have, in addition to the um, situation in Maikadra, which, you know, the amnesty has reported on, and so has the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission, um, you have um, reports from refugees that have fled to Sudan from, you know, a, a, a town close called Humera, where they said that, you know, basically the same thing happened to, um, or something along the same lines has happened to Tigrayan, um, ethnic Tigrayans living in that area um, at the hands of some Amhara regional forces. So I think it's, um, like Susan said, it's, it's a very complex um, situation um, with, you know, both sides trying to keep, um, to, you know, give a specific narrative. Um, when it's, and it's obviously very competing. Um, and I think that the the fact of the matter is obviously somewhere in, in the middle. So I think it's important to, to keep, um, keep that in mind as well. No, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, I'm seeing a lot of comments in, in the comment section right now. And believe me, the narratives, the war of narratives, uh, it's going on right now uh, during our discussion on YouTube. I'm so surprised. I'm trying not to pay attention to it, but it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's a uh, real, um, it's it's exactly what what's what's going on, and that's that's the difficulty. And I think that's why we want to keep the focus on. On, on on civilians um what is what are the consequences for the region because we know that sudan is already fragile and has been so for a long time and it's you know sudan is trying to is, is in a transition itself so what what is uh, what are the regional consequences um globally Is is that directed at anyone in particular? Not not necessarily. Or William, if you want to go first. I mean, I think um, my understanding of this of this situation is obviously it's a obviously it's a you know very serious situation in its in itself that's occurring in in Tigray. I mean, you know what what we have to be clear about here is that because of this information um, blackout, um, because of the the you know the, the you know therefore the sort of you know ability to control the narrative or the battle for the narrative. Currently, we have no idea um, how many um, combatants have been killed um, in, this, in this conflict so far. We have no idea how many civilians have been killed. We have no real idea what the conflict looks like on the ground. Um, and we do not know the conditions or the numbers of all the people internally displaced in Tigray. We've had, you know, what looks like at least a de facto um, annexation, reclaiming of territory in West Tigray um, by Amhara factions and the same in, in Southern Tigray as well. So there was just a huge amount that is not known um, about this conflict. And I think really, actually, it's that absence of evidence, which is the most important thing here. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, we do know um, and we have all seen and we've heard a lot um, about these very serious atrocities in Maikadra. Um, committed by, um, you know, as reported by the Human Rights Commission. But we do not know anything else um, in much detail, and we certainly do not have a full picture of what has been occurring across Tigray um, over the last three and a half months. And that should be the, the focus of, of all of us if we're concerned about uh, human suffering and, and atrocities um, and, the, and the consequences of this conflict. So there is, you know, a, a very serious situation in Tigray which is occurring right now. Um, it could get better rapidly if the federal government is to um, eliminate all Tigrayan forces and there is no significant um, growing resistance um, to the establishment of a provisional government. But that isn't necessarily going to be the political path forward here at all. So we could well see this conflict, a similar type of situation to what we have now, um, enduring to some degree, um, which will obviously exacerbate that, that humanitarian problem and all of the other problems. So we should keep our focus there. But what we do have in Ethiopia is obviously a broader problem of political fragility, you know, a very unsettled transition. And I think a lot depends upon the cause um, of the situation in Tigray. Obviously, the federal government has, has claimed victory and it will be establishing a provisional government. Now, 
if that turns out to um, you, you know, to align with reality, let's say, um, and that we go smoothly from here with the federal government's plans, we could actually see a situation where the federal government and the ruling party is able to assert itself and to consolidate um, its authority across Ethiopia. If we move into a situation where the claims of victory are proved to be somewhat premature, um, and the suggestion that the Tigrayan society and population, the, 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 you know, the, the, lower, the lower ranks of the government and the party in Tigray end up you know, resisting en masse um, to this federal intervention and the establishment of a transitional government, well, that could be a major blow um, to the federal government, both in terms of sapping its resources, uh, getting itself you know, dragged into the proverbial quagmire. Um, and in that case, that will you know, in potentially increase um, Ethiopia's political vulnerability. It could embolden other government opponents. Uh, we've already seen a major blow, uh, fragmentation of Ethiopian armed forces um, with the, uh, you know, the commandeering of the Northern Command um, by the Tigrayan forces. You know, could we see further uh, problem fractures within the armed forces? These would all be, you know, hugely consequential developments. And I think at that point, there could be concerns for broader regional stability. Um, you know, more, um, more directly than that, um, of course, we have the Eritrea situation, which has you know, clearly been a significant amount of support um, for the Ethiopian federal intervention here. Um, evidently, the Tigrayan forces are trying to increase Eritrea's involvement. We've seen the multiple missile attacks. Could that develop and the instability spread into Eritrea? Possibly. And then there is also the potential um, for instability in Sudan and particularly in eastern Sudan as well. But it's really, I think, only if this conflict situation entrenches in Tigray, therefore leads to a weakening um, further vulnerabilities in Ethiopia that we could have you know, sort of seismic, um, broader regional consequences. Thank you. Uh, can I speak? Yep. Okay. Uh, the Horn of Africa is uh, one of uh, the unstable region uh, in the world. Uh, obviously, uh, this conflict would drag this region into uh, chaos. Ethiopia has been considered to be the oasis of stability in the region, a country with more than 110 million people, as well as the strong security uh, forces. Uh, but if uh, this con conflict is not contained and controlled, uh, it could drag other countries into the conflict, such as Sudan, South Sudan, Eritrea, Somalia, and other regions. And uh, this conflict could look like uh, the Great Lake region conflict, which was happening in uh, Central Africa uh, before a few years. Uh, and also the refugee crisis could affect uh, the region, uh, Eritrea, Sudan, and uh, South Sudan, and uh, other, other regions. And also, uh, if there is continued instability in Ethiopia, uh, many uh, groups like uh, Al-Shabaab and other terrorist groups could get uh, really a better condition to uh, to do terrorist activities in the region. So I think it, it has a huge risk for the stability of the region, no, no question about it. But I think my problem is, yes, uh, we don't have uh, really much information and evidence about uh, what's happening in Tigray, but uh, there are, I think, clear uh, information and evidence about what's happening. For instance, uh, recently, uh, the former House of Federation, uh, Speaker of the House of Federation, has surrendered to the federal government. This is uh, an indication that the government is in control of the situation and uh, winning this war. And you don't, in the last few days, you don't see even uh, TPLF uh, really uh, claiming that, uh, that, they are, that they didn't lose uh, this war. Uh, of course, they are, they, are, they are saying they continue to fight, but it's not clear how they do it. So I think there are clear indications that the government is in control. And uh, as I, I indicated earlier, uh, we have sufficient evidence as to what happened in my cadre. And uh, I am very surprised that uh, few uh, refugees in Sudan said that uh, they have been targeted uh, and 
we have strong evidence uh, produced by Minas International and in Ethiopian Human Rights Commission. And it's, it's very strange to really compare these two evidences because these two organizations are reputable organizations who have confirmed uh, the commission of these atrocities by Tigrayan affiliated uh, groups. And just a few refugees in Sudan said something else and we don't accept this reality. So in this case, how can we proceed? How can we address this uh, situation? I think now any uh, human, rights, human rights group could access uh, my cadre and other regions uh, to, to really get the, the evidence and the information. So let's be clear and uh, let's take action and some kind of uh, reaction to uh, the situation where we have sufficient evidence and information. Well, I think I think just, William just, has just, made yeah, William just on has, that, yeah, just William on has that made point. clear that you know that there's a, the government controls the narrative as well. So I want to to give uh, William a chance to respond to that too. Yeah, I mean, it just it's I I think the point here is that um, the point I was making is that yes, there has been documentation um, by Amnesty and the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission um, of of one incident in one part of one part of Tigray, one town of Tigray, and indeed it's a very very serious incident, particularly the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission, the evidence in that report was very, very convincing. Um, the amnesty report was the evidence was was weaker. Now, with the Human Rights Commission, that was a preliminary report. Um, I've spoken to people who are involved in the documentation. Um, and what they are doing is trying to you know, establish um, you know, some of the broader context, um, indeed, trying to speak to some of the refugees um, who fled into Sudan, who are overwhelmingly Tigrayan. And perhaps we will then see, you know, a similar type of um, a similar type of, of evidence that's been presented about about the incident in, 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 in my Katra. Um, so I, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't disregard um, the reporting of the media um, from the Sudanese refugee camps. I know there was the suggestion from the government that it was infiltration of the camps um, by TPLF operatives, but I don't think that's been proven. Um, so I think, you know, the evidence from the refugee camps, from people who fled the conflict, is some of the valid um, evidence we have at the moment. Of course, there can always be better evidence presented, um, but that's, you know, that, that's, that's what we have at the moment. But I think the major point is that, you know, as I described before, at the moment, largely, in terms of independent monitoring and verification um, of the claims of the two sides, Basically, this is being a conflict that is being carried out under the cover of darkness at the moment. We have really very little independent access and monitoring. Um, and I think this should be remembered. Um, and I think this should be prioritized as a concern rather than just focusing on the, um, the, the incident, the one atrocity that has been well documented so far. Because we may well find out that there have been many other atrocities. I mean, I am hearing reports of thousands of deaths of civilians and combatants. Um, I can't prove that, um, but as time goes on, you know, reports will emerge, um, incidents will be detailed. And I think we should very much keep an open mind about that. No, I fully, um, I, I do agree with you. I think, I think William, I think we should, you know, in, in these wars, the government often controls the narratives over the others. Um, one question that I would like to go to Susan and um, Sarah is um, the role of the African Union and then the role of various UN agencies. Um, I know you, you both kind of specialize perhaps more uh, in that area, what have uh, UN agencies and the AU, um, what have they been um, doing or discussing or not discussing? Sarah, did you want to leave that one off? To... Sure, sure, I can start that one. So um, I think that there's been, um, you know, a large um, response, you know, by UN agencies, I think specifically the UN GHD and the High Commissioner um, Philippa Brandi. Um, you know, I think on a daily basis, he's been continually speaking out for the need for humanitarian access um, over the last few weeks when, when it wasn't available. Um, and, you know, how the blocking of aid 
um, into Tigray was, you know, an urgent threat to an already vulnerable population there. So um, as mentioned before, there were already, you know, at least um, almost 100,000 Eritrean refugees in, you know, four camps in Tigray. There's also, um, you know, um, a large number of already displaced uh, Ethiopians that were relying on this aid already before the situation um, came to pass. And, you know, he's traveled to Hamdayat in uh, Sudan to, you know, meet with refugees and, you know, call for support for the camps there. You know, the camps that are um, being built for refugees are in a very, you know, remote area um, with very little access. Um, and so trying to ensure that, that they are, you know, taken care of in their time of need. Um, he's also expressed, you know, significant concern um, about some reports coming in regarding Eritrean refugees being, you know, forcibly repatriated um, to Eritrea or, you know, it's somehow being um, interacted with, with possible, the possible involvement of Eritrean forces. Um, none of that can obviously be confirmed, but um, he has mentioned that, that, you know, that would um, mark like an, a, a very significant breach of international norms and international law. So, um, um, obviously, you know, they're happy to see that the, the government and the um, refugee agencies and the aid agencies have, you um, uh, pact actually, you know, start allowing some hopefully unfettered, supposedly unfettered access um, to the region. But I think as William pointed out, um, and um, Susan pointed out, you know, ensuring that that's the case is going to be um, um, instrumental in how how that plays out. Um, additionally, some other organizations within the UN have been outspoken. Obviously, the Human Rights Commission, um, High Commissioner for Human Rights, has you know released some statements, um, multiple statements, which I think is important to note. Um, I think shows the severity of the risks of the conflict um, because um, I think her preference for for diplomacy is a little bit more um, behind the scenes and and one on one. Um, and also, the Office on the Special Advisors on the Prevention of Genocide and R2P um, released a very strong statement. Um, highlighting, you know, for the UN, the risks of atrocity crimes being committed, not only into gray, but as we've been discussing the, the broader um, country. And so stating that, you know, the roots of the situation aren't addressed that, you know, atrocities, the risk for atrocities in Ethiopia, in Tigray and, and otherwise is, remains high. Um, I guess I'll kind of wrap up with the, the council, the security council specifically. Um, so I mentioned before the council hasn't met formally or produced any type of press statement or formal statement on the situation. Um, they've only met on the situation under any other business or AOB. Um, and what's unique about AOB, for those who don't know, is that you know no state can veto a holding of an AOB meeting, um, but the meetings are informal, not on the record, and completely private. So unless you you know um, a state comes out and says you know what what will happen there, you're um, the general public um, and the wider community isn't going to know. Um, and I think as some have seen, there was some back and forth on whether to not, whether to hold a meeting or not to hold a meeting, um, you know, basically some of the African states wanting to, you know, postpone the holding of the meeting because they wanted to see how the AU was going to, um, the AU that had sent envoys were going to reach Addis and um, what impact that was going to have um, um, on the, the situation there. Um, so. Um, you know, I mean, my hope is that, you know, I think that the UN Security Council should be taking a more um, outward stance on the situation and, you know, calling for the protection of civilians, you know, trying to, in, um, calling for the insurance of the delivery of humanitarian aid um, and, and you know, expressing that, you know, under uh, that, you know, protection of civilians and, um, you know, getting access to see, you know, and assess what's actually the situation on the ground is, is very important. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, maybe I can just add on on the African Union. Um, mm -hmm. So the um, under South African President Ramaphosa, who currently chairs the African Union, uh, three envoys, former presidents, were were appointed to to go to uh, talk to the federal government. Um, ideally, talk to other parties as well about how to how to silence the guns, um, which is the African Union's priority and theme this year as part of its broader agenda 2063. Um, and 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 I think um, it's really important if we look at if we look back at other circumstances where there have been risks or circumstances of, of mass atrocities um, in the region um, related to domestic issues that may or may not have had had regional implications like Kenya um, in in the election violence. Um, 
it's really critical that the international community um, rallies behind and provides um, support through its diplomatic messaging, through um, you know, technical and financial assistance, if and as needed, to the African Union's um, initiatives and work. Uh, and I think that, that this will become increasingly important. One of, one of the biggest challenges that I think is faced on, on a political front um, is this deep, deep polarization and the the perception um, that that comes from the legacy of you know 30 years of, of a government where there were reported documented um, instances of corruption of human rights abuses um, and and the expectations and the divisions that have, have been created over the last um, two and a half years and and one of those is a sense that any sort of negotiation accords equivalence between the government Government itself and the TPLF. And, and I think this is where um, th there needs to be a, a more creative um, set of thinking and, and really a more foundational conversation about the horrific costs of violence. And on the other hand, the potential and possibility if Ethiopia um, were to be able to continue on this trajectory that meets the great hopes and expectations of the Ethiopian people for, for a different kind of country going forward. And, and I think that this is an incredibly um, complex conversation to navigate. Um, but uh, I, I also worry that in the context of the UN Security Council, which remains incredibly divided itself, you know, leave aside Ethiopia as a specific issue, um, that the choreography leading into that needs to be really carefully managed. Um, and so in that circumstance, activating um, some of the UN agencies, using the UN's good offices and I think some of its, its best possibilities to be seen as an independent body, which you know clearly, clearly we see in, in the conversation that's taking place on the sidelines of, of this panel, that um, we need to get to a place where people have some greater trust and some greater credibility mm -hmm. um, in, in the institutions that exist and will hopefully protect um, citizens going forward. Yeah, and looking at the comments on, on the side, I wonder how some kind of national dialogue between these uh, between different groups and communities can, can take place considering the, the current conflicts. How how do you see that happening? Perhaps perhaps William, do you see something like that happening between some kind of how can you establish trust between people to discuss these things, considering the narratives are so, you know, polarized. I mean, I think it's something which is, um, you know, it's, it's something which is clearly needed. It has uh, quite a lot of support, uh, the concept of a national dialogue it has quite a lot of support from the Ethiopian political elite, um, including from the opposition. Um, arguably, it's something which should, should, should have occurred at the outset of this transition, uh, particularly, you know, especially in retrospect, we can, we can see that. Um, and I think really what's happening at the moment um, is that we are, in a period where the trajectory is that you know, the, the ruling party, um, the, the prosperity party, um, it has been sort of you know, consolidating um, its position, let's say, after recently being established. Um, we've had all of the political problems this year, you know, partly related to the COVID, um, the COVID-induced election delay. And that's put us in a circumstance where um, a lot of the main opposition actors um, are either um, imprisoned as a result of the July violence um, in Oromia. Um, and now, of course, we have the, um, the conflict against the only you know, formal opposition bloc in the federal parliament, the TPLF. Um, so I think, you know, that the, you know, the, the, the optimal moment for a national dialogue to really assess, you know, a post-EPIDF Ethiopia, um, to work out how all these political forces can be reintegrated um, into Ethiopia after being exiled, and to deal with these major, you know, political differences we have, you know, the opposition to the, to, you know, to the multinational or ethnic federal system, um, the, you know, the differences over history and the competing um, narratives, for example, between you know, Oromo and Amhara nationalists, for example, or obviously the Tigrayan question that is so prominent now. The ideal time to, have, to address that would have been at the outset of this transition. We're now into a process where it's become, you know, kind of a, an in intensification of a violent power struggle. And if we are going to get to a meaningful national dialogue, 
it will mean a fundamental rethinking and change of approach to Ethiopia's political problems. At the moment, we have one political vision, um, well, you know, a broad political vision um, that is being implemented you know, primarily from, from the center. We don't know all the details of the end state, but we see a process where that federal and central power um, is being exerted along with the vision. Um, and that's the path we're on at the moment. Um, our concerns at Crisis Group is that is going to lead to continued instability due to blowback from political forces, particularly ethno-nationalist political forces that do not share that vision. Um, but at the moment, um, there isn't really any sign um, of that type of, you know, compromising um, approach, um, you know, from, from the ruling party and, and the federal government. Thank you, William. Um, that I think uh, that leaves us um, only two minutes to um, thank you um, for participating in this discussion. Uh, obviously, the comments on the side prove that there's a lot of work to do. There's a lot of polarization, um, a lot of different narratives. And I think, you know, uh, it's important to remind our audience uh, to keep comments <laughs> polite. Um, uh, thank you very much to the four of you for joining our discussion today. Um, I hope we'll, we'll look at the situation further. Um, so thank you very much. And uh, I hope you have a nice um, Christmas break uh, wherever you are as well. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.